Hey everybody, this is Roy Carter from Rectitude Media, and I uh, just want to share some thoughts with you from my new book that I'm writing. There have been many critical times in history when those who struggle against the tide of apathy and oppression have decided to become beacons in the fog. It takes a bravery that most people cannot fathom to see the direction in which certain paths lead into tyrannical decay and to speak out against it. Yet today we still have the same problems that humanity has always faced before yet on an unimaginably larger scale. Most people can feel it. The burdening debt, the news waves speaking about terror and stock markets, about more and more layoffs and the silent gargle of fabricated government figures that sing sultry undertones of calmness, declaring everything all right. Yes, we try again and again to pass the time, to keep oneself occupied by our social media posts, movie and television shows, Favorite sports teams, video games, or family and whatnot? All are mere grounding for our own perceptions of sanity. So much so that it makes the average person ask, Why should I care? I got problems of my own, you see. What's the point of trying if everybody is stupid and nobody cares? And so forth. The truth is, we all have been programmed into believing common held beliefs and massive social trends. We are all conditioned into believing that we have a set of rules that we must adhere to, and to which powerful entities we submit to without question. It is vital for one to have the belief that society is good, and that the government loves you, that all the police are friendly, and that public education actually teaches you everything and anything needed to succeed in life, that the morality so often treasured by philosophers of old, still retains their valued ideologies and ethics of the good in humanity. But we all know this to not be what goes on in reality. We as a society have developed into a huddled mob of voices all ready to explore the electronic world and all of its technological wonders. We have access to billions of sources at the push of a button and still some people are only happy in their relatively small circles of like-minded thinking. For example, in our online discussions we hold the most popular and well-funded news outlets as the highest of mediators. We ridicule and condemn those who find multiple sources proving their arguments from still well-documented lesser-known entities that don't have as much money, connections, and power, or affiliations. We collectively believe that rich corporations have our best interests in mind, that the internet will forever to continue to evolve into a more free and open society, and that the restriction of freedoms for more securities are a good thing. Yet the passage of free trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the myriad of other treaties being passed behind closed doors speak silent, treacherous intentions. There is no democratic process involved in this whatsoever. The fate and fortunes of us all are being manipulated in the open by secretive factions. The average person doesn't see that society is being molded into a one-world government, that everything they known to love of their country, their family, their own very way of life is constantly being threatened. Instead, we sheepishly all out others who cry foul with a properly associated stereotype in which we've been programmed to spew out, belittling any credibility or points they make, no matter how valid or inaccurate. We say that it's okay to prosecute whistleblowers who expose the pure insanity and cruelty that governments and private enterprises around the world alike partake in. We group think that we will all be cared for if we just submit to these authoritarian principles. That if we were to just join with the similar affiliations and partake in the demonization of others, that we will be spared from being criticized ourselves. History is a beautiful and wondrous thing for it reminds us of the past that we have taken before. When we examine the lives of society at that time, and use a thought exercise of placing ourselves in those times, the answers become a lot more obvious. We all ask how the people of Germany could allow a man like Hitler to rise to power. 
because the facts have been displayed for all of us to see as a modernized perception would lead us to believe. We know that the slave trade throughout history was inherently evil, yet we callously continue to support the modern incarnations of it through sweatshops and the transfer of manufacturing to designated Eastern societies in which we don't seem to give much care or thought to. We support regimes, regimes like Saudi Arabia, who publicly murder those who seek true democratically free principles while we tear ourselves apart over racial division and tribal mentalities. Why is it that we let crazy people in charge? From the cold calculating derivatives trader hell-bent on extrapolation to the wide-eyed globalist politician who wants to destroy the very idea of nations to be bent into some twisted configuration of oligarchical dom dom domination. We allow these people with their wealth and influence to drive in the direction of the future of humanity. So we must look back at history to see the many different triumphs that we have made over astronomical odds, the separation of church and state for genuine scientific discoveries, the many different inventions of sanitational devices that have made it so that we don't die from previously considered pandemics, the many various revolutionary concepts that have created nations or expanded our consciousness as a dominant life form on this planet. When we see the interconnectivity of how we are meant to work together towards true equality and freedom, then we begin to see our place in the world. When you allow yourself to be open to a multitude of opinions and other people's perceptions, then you begin to see where they're coming from, and by judging their actions, you can see what forces in the world they represent. We don't have to group ourselves into any specific ideology or thought process if we don't want to, or if it makes no sense in the progression of human development. Yet when every opinion is valued and every sentiment is thoroughly explained, we can finally have that feeling that we individually matter. Everyone should have a radio show, a TV show, or media outlet. Everyone should care about the future and plan feasible solutions instead of fear-based taxation. We can only benefit as a society on both the individual and collective conscious when we evaluate the base components and study the intricate details we have in a free and open society. There is no need for moral arbiters to tell us what to watch, what to wear, or what to think. We can do it for ourselves and purge ourselves from contentious notions of controlling entities and centralized banking elites. It is because and only because we allow ourselves to be pre-programmed into traditionally selected groupings that we are enslaved. Once we are all realize that we all have the ability to do good or evil, to police ourselves or to give in a tyranny, to improve our communities without needing direction from a federal statesman or media conglomerate. By listening to others, dealing with criticisms, and moving forth with the best agreed upon plan, we start destroying the barriers that have been placed in front of us by pre-existing notions from dead kings of old thought oppression. We could easily solve most of the world's problems with the most simplest forms of compassion and empathy. When we let greedy, hateful psychopaths run the day-to-day -day operations of our lives, it only creates more division and hatred. We have the ability to create new technologies that feed everyone, not just half the planet. We can work together while celebrating our cultural and national intricacies that make us who we are. It is through enlightened, rational thinking with a deeply spiritual acceptance of others that we can accomplish great things. I'm not saying this to sound like some new age hippie people. We affect multiple people's perceptions each day just by giving a simple good morning or have a great day to some random strangers. So when we succumb to momentary depression, differences in opinions or banking cartels and their governmental puppets, we have to remember that despite the general public's faults, we do still have at least something in common. Not everyone is on the same level or point in their lives, but we all have things that make us smile or feel human. 
we need to see the difference between true commonality and marketed tropes. And we fall prey to that in advertising, peer pressure and manipulation. Those are only meant to hold happiness on a pedestal and make you feel horrible and incomplete for not having it. It's hard for people to accept the fact that 90% of the events and circumstances that we face are from our own real choosing. We're supposed to speak out against monopolization. We're supposed to speak out against centralization and the limitations that we implement for our rights to choose and to consent. Competition is not a sin like John D. Rockefeller would have us all admit. It is necessary for the advancement of any practice, either economical or governmental. When we allow ourselves to be compacted into select tubes based on our fears and preconceived notions of societal limitations, then we destroy our ability to experience more about ourselves, others, and the great enigmas of our mystifying multiverse. The answer is not to chastise someone for having an alternative opinion, but to acknowledge their right to be able to have it, no matter how misguided. When an entity decides to use force or physical aggression and confinement over someone else, they enforce a notion of moral authority. It is up to us all to decide whether or not it was warranted and to see the effects that would result from hindering that party's actions. If in doing so it stops the offending dominant force from destroying the rights and freedoms of another party or multiple parties from living their lives peacefully, then that is beneficial for society. If this principle is not discerned from the original point of conflict, it will continue to live on in another incarnation of injustice, and any punishment or initial argument becomes useless anyways. That is why we all need to try to work together and define the things that we do agree on instead of focusing on the negative aspects. When humanity begins to do this on a greater magnitude, then we will discover that we, there are a lot fewer violent psychopaths out there than we originally thought, and those with malevolent intentions will eventually expose themselves through their own greedy, egotistical way, means. Fixing the world isn't nearly as complicated as we think. Just by trying and giving a damn about yourself, your family, and others, there's that potential to see all sides' arguments while discovering new solutions that benefit us all. When we find ways to destroy the barriers put in place against us to prosper, then we start to find meaning. You don't need to have the newest iPhone or the highest fashion or the fastest sports cars to be happy. All you really need is an ethical code of conduct where you keep an open mind while accepting the input of others. Sort out the bullshit from the truth and do your own research. It's up to us all to decide for ourselves and expose to others ideas and opinions that don't hold up to logical criticism. Yes, it's nice to have fun toys and vacations and other distractions that help to keep one's perspectives refreshed, but once those possessions begin to take over your life and become a burden, then you didn't really need them to begin with. Even in the most extremely impoverished situations, you can find a way to have fun and celebrate life. Even finding creative ways to protest the inequalities and injustices of the world can be as entertaining as annoying those who refuse to see any other perspectives but their own. Take comfort in knowing when to become a purposeful annoyance to others and to the state, because just by bringing up those issues, you start to influence the right thought processes needed to propel the winds of change. Well, this is the first segment of my book, The Ethics of Personal Peace. Stay tuned for more info on this and my upcoming economic collapse series on Iceland. Have a good one.